Okay, welcome to Tuesday, May 25th class session in our differential equations class. Uh, if you have any questions you wanna just record on the paper, you can put them in the chat or audio them and we'll get right to them. These are the major topics today. We didn't really explain, we talked about quantitative techniques, but we didn't qualitative techniques, but we didn't talk about exactly what a slope field is. So that's where we're gonna start. That's gonna help you out on a homework problem, possibly that you're submitting tonight. And I'll give you a way to use Mathematica to generate soap fields if you haven't already experimented with that yet. So what I'm gonna do first, let's do this. I, I do less and less time we're going to spend getting you oriented to class because you are getting oriented. But I just want to show you this on my website just to make sure you know this is how we're doing it. I'm going to pull up a browser here and go to my website. Uh, you know, base website, just websites.delta.edu slash bdredmond, but you could probably bookmark semesters, spring, Math 264, you could just bookmark this page that says Math 264 home. You've certainly seen this page because you've clicked on the link to enter the class session. Several of you clicked on the links for the office hours. Okay, so, and you remember that you hand in assignments tonight at this Math 264 assignments folder. That assignments folder is also reproduced here in week one. So here's our outline that we're working on. Really, you're gonna pick up here in one three right now and talk about one three, one four, one five, one six. Uh, your homework problems that I, I link to these on the website in case I just alter the problem slightly because I've already posted many solutions to problems from the book. I'm just not gonna repeat them from semester to semester. I just write new problems. What I wanted to show you among the handouts was, remember we have class session notes and office hour notes. So for example, in this past hour, there were some people asking me questions and I just copied the paper that I scribbled on during the office hour notes. I didn't record the session, but I copied the paper that I was scribbling notes on. And if you wanna see what questions you're asking and what notes I scribbled, it was just one page of notes. Now, it's not extremely handy to see one page of scribblings, but maybe if it brings something to your attention that you saw, or that if we use it to say something today, that would be valuable. Um, remember that under, under handouts, office hour notes, class session notes. Here are the class session notes from yesterday, May 24. I'm not gonna open those up right now. Uh, remember also videos posted, besides just all the videos that you should be consuming. And certainly I want you to have watched the first principles videos and Mixing problem videos will get into some mixing problems. We might do an example of that today, or we, we'll certainly do an example of it in sections one, eight, one, nine. Euler's method we'll do today. Phase lines we'll do today. Bifurcation, these last three categories are on tomorrow's menu. But definitely look at all those videos. They're short, they're consumable. But also remember, you can consume the class session video here under May 24. I'm not suggesting you should rewatch this, but just in case you get well, missing. This is massive. Okay, I'm not gonna listen to myself. But in case you miss a live session, this is the session that we did yesterday. And it's, listed on a YouTube channel and you can go to the whole YouTube channel. Uh, all the class sessions is in this YouTube playlist right here. Excuse me. I'm not gonna go and visit them. Uh, 
all these topics videos that I have right here are on a playlist. If you wanna just run that playlist for hours on end. <laughs> and, and I've got some recommended problems here too. Uh, sometimes people might comment, uh, could you explain why you did that in the recommended problem? I don't have a lot of videos like that because people haven't actually always asked a lot of questions about the recommended problems. They just read the answers and they're often happy with that. They don't have to be. But if you see something on my website, a problem, a solution that I wrote, and you want to know why I wrote this and not that, or why I made such a fuss about something, I could just do a one minute video and tell you why you had to make a fuss about that thing. So then I would just put it on these recommended problems so you can investigate those as you like. Today, we will look at some of this technology, in particular, Excel spreadsheets in section 1.4. And we'll probably start the day playing with some of these Mathematica notebooks. So my suggestion to you was that you already had Mathematic installed by now. I definitely think you want to do that because you can use lots of tools, but the farther we go along, the more of those tools will kind of drop out that they're not full power tools. You know, like Desmos does a lot, but it doesn't do everything we need. Same thing with Excel or GeoGebra or even some of the other ones people have mentioned. Mathematica pretty much does it all as far as we need in this class. So you need that installed on your computer. And then I'll show you how to use these two notebooks. Mathematica has a steep learning curve, but it has an exceptional help menu. And these notebooks I wrote to demo doing problems. So you could just use these notebooks and modify them to do a problem you're doing. I think uh, the major pain with Mathematica often is like very picky about syntax, very picky about its rules for naming things. So it takes a while to get used to that, but we'll demonstrate some of it. And if you ever wanna just have some fun or you don't know what to do with it, and I'll show that later, you go into the documentation menu and you look up differential equations. And it'll give you all the functions that can help you work on differential equations and live examples that you could again, execute, copy and paste and modify to your problems. So that's where a program like Mathematica really shines the extensive documentation and the extensive depth of the program. So, don't go to McDonald's and buy a Happy Meal and then just eat the fries and throw out the rest. You understand what I'm saying? You bought this meal, a very large meal that I prepared for you. Make sure you consume all of it. So get time to watch these videos, get time to play with the computer technologies I'm showing you. And the reason why is because it'll make you faster. It'll make you much, much faster when it counts. You can always make do to get something done, right? But you wanna, you wanna do it better and better, quicker and quicker. That's the kind of logic we're using. Okay, so I will stop that sharing. So I just wanna show you where things are on our website. I'm gonna pop over, although I don't often do this, I'm gonna pop over to the whiteboard for a second and I might even make an appearance. So let me make sure I've got this pinned correctly. There's the whiteboard. Okay, good. And again, if you wanna ask any questions, you do that. Let me see if I can adjust this slightly. Someday I'll show you the whole basement television studio, but today we got other things to do. So if you have a question, uh, you can shout it out or put it on the chat because I'm not sitting then now in front of my computer, but I'll turn my computer around without breaking anything, hopefully. 
just so I can catch you if you type something in the chat. Well, let me show you what I put up here. So just titles of the sections we've done so far. So just as a reminder, but also as a path, you know, where we're going today. So and I did this clockwise. So first we talked about what a differential equation was, and what modeling is, and how we can use differential equations to predict things that are going to happen to make predictions, to observe change. A derivative is a rate of change. And rate of change means past and future. And now we're excited because we can talk about predicting what will happen in the future. But I don't want to turn this course into what it was 30 or 40 years ago, where I just gave you a thick book of formulas and told you to apply these formulas and these conditions that's got limitations, got serious limitations. So the authors want to present this to you in a holistic way. They gave you these three weapons, the analytic technique, qualitative technique, and the numerical technique. And so we demonstrated, and there are many analytic techniques, many qualitative techniques, and many numerical techniques. We're just doing demos right now. Remember, chapter one sets parameters for the whole course. So I showed you a particular analytic technique called separation of variables. If your differential equation is in a certain form and you can move the y's to one side legitimately, the t's to the other side, independent variable one side, dependent variable the other side, you could possibly hope to integrate twice and find an exact answer. Not always, but possibly. Let's, let's say you're only two integrals away from an answer. So, Brute force, analytic technique, formula, that's kind of the traditional gold standard. Here's the formula that predicts the future. Next, because even if I can separate variables, maybe the integrals are impossible to perform for me or for a machine. So is there any way I can quickly analyze the qualities of the solutions. That's what I say, qualitative solutions. And that's what I demonstrated in the logistic growth model and the exponential growth model. Even a little bit in that predator-prey system at the very end last time. But I didn't legitimately tell you what a slope field is or how powerful this is, how really, really powerful this is. You'll be shocked at how effective it is to analyze the quality of solutions with a slope field. And then we're going to take that one step further. So some problems are so messy, I don't even know if I can understand the qualities of the answers or the problems. Well, maybe then I just got to do some serious number crunching. A numerical approximation of an answer tells me how that thing might be waving around. Is it, oh, now I see how it works. Maybe then I could discuss the qualities. Maybe then I could, if I was very lucky, find a formula. So these are the weapons, analytic, qualitative, numerical. But that's where we're going to start. But we still have some serious existential roadblocks in our way. You know, even from an algebra class, that just because you can write down an equation, doesn't mean that equation has an answer, right? Here's a famous equation. This is a legitimate algebraic equation, but for quite some time, people just understood that this had no answer because there was no real number that you could square to get minus one. Well, it didn't take people long to get around this since they wanted to solve this equation, since they have found this equation and others like it useful. They invented a hack for solving this equation, and that is they made up a new system of numbers. Well, now in the real numbers, this equation has no answer, but in the complex numbers it does. So an answer exists for this equation. Now you also know that two complex numbers satisfy this equation, right? 
that's a problem in and of itself. If I'm solving an equation, someone asks me, okay, what's the temperature going to be in Alaska tomorrow? And I solve my differential equation, I get two answers. But it's either going to be 55 or it's going to be minus 20. Well, both answers might be mathematically legitimate, but you know that both things aren't going to come true at the same time, right? So not only do we want our problems to have answers, we want our problems to have unique answers. That would be like the best possible case. And you can have this, but you don't always have this. So that's going to be an important discussion. Then, we're going to prepare to finish chapter one with a qualitative discussion that's going to open the door to us like bulk solving differential equations, solving whole batches of differential equations at once. And that's the concept of what an equilibria is. And I mentioned equilibriums, the plural equilibria last time where I talked about a stable equilibrium, not stable equilibrium. But there's a, there's a, a whole other batch of ideas we could talk about for equilibrium. And then here's a common and useful tool for dealing with equilibriums called phase length. OK, so first, let's get some slope field down. Let's show you how to do this in Mathematica so you can finish the problem you're working on for tonight and get set to do this. This, this technique will show us how to do Euler's method. So I didn't stand up here to be on camera. I stood up here because I wanted to make a particular drawing here to explain to you what a slope field is. So let's look at a simple differential equation. Let's not make it too complicated. Let's say dy dt is y plus t. Now that is a relatively simple differential equation, right? But if you stare at it for a few minutes, you realize it's not separable. You cannot just subtract y and multiply both sides by dt and get the y's and the t separated, like one point two section. It's because of the addition sign. If they were multiplied, you could multiply and divide but you cannot gather all the y's on one side and all the t's on the other. So even though this is very simple, you can't use that technique from section 1.2. Okay, we need another technique. Now, in general, I want you to think about differential equations in a very physical way. What appears on the right-hand side could be a horrid, horrid mess, but, for a first order equation, it can only be made out of two things, t's and y's. So if I speak very generally, this is the way people speak in differential equations. The right-hand side of a differential equation is just a combination of t's and y's. Could be messy, could be horrible, could be simple. But all it is is a function of t and y. On the left-hand side, I have the derivative. But the derivative is better known as the rate of change, or in plain English, slope. So this is how I want you to think about differential equation. Differential equation is a formula for the slope, formula for the slope, OK? We could massively exploit that right here. So let me make a drawing. And maybe you can anticipate what I'm about to do but it still pays to have a visual. Let's draw the T, Y axis here. I'm not gonna be super accurate. I'm just gonna be general. And every point in this plane has a name T and Y. But by this formula, that means I can name the slope at every point in that plane. So I'll make a chart here of t's and y's. And then let me calculate the slope at some sample points. 
Oh, I'm not sure always what colors are the best colors, but let's try something really simple like zero, zero. You know, that means you're right there. What is the slope at zero, zero? According to this formula, the slope at zero, zero is zero. I'll use the traditional letter M for slope if you like, or just dy dt. And now you see what I'm about to do. That wasn't so painful. I'll do it again. About one minus one is right there. I coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, when I take one and minus one, I wrote in a traditional order ty here, I wrote in a different order here. But the minus one goes in for the y, the one goes in for the t, again, slope zero. at one minus one. I'm not gonna mark one minus one, I'll just say it's over there. Uh, you might see what I'm heading for here, right? Uh, another place it would be zero would be two minus two. But you're not gonna let me do that too many more times because you're gonna get bored. Of course, minus one, one and minus two, two. At all of those places, I have zero slope. Think of this as a little weather vane or indicator. Okay, let me try some other ones. How about at one, zero, one for t, zero for y. That would give me a slope of one plus zero is one. I can draw a slope one, 45 degree line. But if I just pull that trick I just did a second ago, how about two and minus one? Slope one, 45 degree line. In fact, you can start picking lots of T's and Y's, but it looks like if I pick T's and Y's on this diagonally down line, which I could name, I will always get a slope of minus one. Now you see I'm starting to cheat. That point right there is at minus two and plus three. Minus two and plus three has a slope of one. Right? So now you start to get excited. Oh, I can fill in lots of slopes. Okay, I'm not gonna fill in a lot more by calculating, but I'll point out this one right here, which is special. How about at minus one and zero? Now that, when I add minus one plus zero, I get minus one. And what's special about that? Well, that's going like this. I can draw slope one, I can draw slope zero, I can draw slope minus one, I'm good at that. But if you add the rest of those in along that line, your slope indicators would look like that. If you backed them up, it would look like that. Where this gets messier is when I go to one and one. One plus one is two, and I'm not so good at drawing the slope of two. Is that a slope of two? Eh, who knows? But I'll pretend it is, and I'll add the other slopes of two, at least what I think is two. Okay, uh, you know, two plus two is slope four. Here's a slope three, here's a slope three, here's a slope three, here's a slope four, here's a slope four. See, now this is getting ridiculous. There's no way I could legitimately say I've drawn something of slope four. So five, how about down in here? At minus two and zero, that would be slope minus two, minus two minus two, uh, getting a little bit sloppy here. In fact, you can tell why I'm getting sloppy because I'm really bored with doing this and I cannot picture myself for the rest of my life ever drawing one of these, right? But I have a friend that can draw them really well. 
Okay, but just to finish the minus three. So this is not a great drawing, but even the crummy drawing it is, gives me a lot of information. For example, this is like an ocean of currents. And what happens if my boat started in the ocean right there? Well, according to that indicator, the boat's gonna drift down here. And then the boat comes to that point, drifts down there, drifts down there, drifts down there. If I put a boat in this ocean at that position, and that position was minus two, one. It looks entirely possible that I can tell the future position of that boat. In fact, I can tell the whole path of that boat. Now it's time to name that line. That line is T plus Y equals minus one. You just do a little algebra tricks, whatever you do for your algebra class, right? But T plus Y is minus one is that red line. That means that y equals negative t minus one is possibly a solution to that differential equation. Let's try it out. Differentiate y with respect to t, you get negative one. Now take this y and add a t to it, you get negative one. There's a solution, a solution that goes through that point. Well, this is, this is like a lazy person's dream. I did no mathematics, I did no calculus. Well, except if you wanna call slope calculus, but you did slope before calculus, right? I know an answer to this differential equation. But I even know more. And, and why I wanna create this picture, I wanted to leave it on the board so if I could refer to it later, possibly. That's why I'm spending time creating this picture. What if I had let my boat rather go here, just slightly different from there? Well, this is like a stream. This is like a current and the current's gonna drag my boat down to be sure it's gonna drag my boat down. But my boat kind of drifts off because there's another current pressing to the right. And now my boat is off course, so to speak but it's actually exactly on the course it wants to be on. And it's heading this way, and now it gets pushed by the wind or the water like that. And then like that. And then like that. That black line must be an answer to my differential equation. Now, the red line I knew the formula for right away because I remember my algebra. I don't know if I know the formula for that black line yet, but we will. What if I had let the boat go here? Similar distance above the red line. I bet you the boat would swing out in a similar way. I'm not drawing these beautifully again, but do you see what I'm drawing? A whole collection of answers. And what about when I go backwards in time? Well, yes, all those answers may have come almost like they came off that red line in a way, although I'm not sure if they actually ever were on that red line. That's a question we have to answer today. Okay, you know what I'm about to do on the bottom. Uh, the only question is what color should I use? So if I let my boat go here, the pink is not a great contrast to red but you can trace how that boat fall, falls down, falls down, falls down. Now this is like, falls down. Qualitatively, this is the gold medal. This is, you know, an A, this is Fort Knox. I have analyzed that problem now. I haven't solved anything except for I have one solution, but I have totally analyzed that problem, at least I believe I have, and I've come up with hundreds, thousands, millions of answers, uncountable number of answers, but qualitatively three kinds. That's straight line solution, 
solutions that peeled off the straight line up and solutions that peeled off the straight line down. Almost like the straight line was a border. Okay, so now what are we gonna do with this? You got all kinds of problems. Say like, well, you've made a sloppy drawing. Uh, not all your curves are fitting these arrows. Yeah, that's right, because I was just presenting. I only drew 25 slope marks, but I have a friend who could draw 25,000 slope marks faster than I can draw 25. And you know what I'm referring to. What I need now is a machine to draw these slope marks for me. And that's not cheating in any way. It's simply repeating this calculation 25,000 times instead of 25 times because I get tired of doing this. Okay, but let's think about what it could be. If this was true, that I could just measure the way the ocean flowed, and that would predict solutions for me, that would be very, very valuable. In fact, it is true. Then you say, well, how do you find the formulas for these black things, these pink things, this red thing? Well, maybe I could go deeper into the machine and ask the machine how it calculates the flow along those lines. And I don't need a machine to do it, but the automating of it, yes, the machine is gonna excel at. Okay, so this is the word picture I wanted to put in your mind today. So now let's go back to our paper. In fact, I'm gonna go back and let's open up a Mathematica notebook. And let's figure out how we could demonstrate drawing a slope field in Mathematica. I can draw a slope field very nicely also in GeoGebra. But I said GeoGebra is only going to be powerful to us for a certain amount of time. So I don't mind if you want to open up GeoGebra. But it's not going to be the one we're going to use for money. Okay. So now I know that a first order differential equation is a formula for the slope in a very casual way. So I'm going to open up one of my Mathematica notebooks. Uh, I would find it on my website. I'm gonna choose this one called slope fields and direction fields. And then slope fields and solutions. And I just might open up a blank one and show you how to do something on a blank one. When you click on this, you're gonna be directed to a Google Drive folder. And the Google Drive folder has all of these Mathematica notebooks in them. You just identify the one that's called what? Slope fields and direction fields. And then you can't, the browser can't open the mathematical file right now. Let's say we just download it. And then if I have Mathematica installed on my computer, I can open it. Now this is popping up a dialog box that you don't see right now, but I'm gonna open the Mathematica file and then we'll take a look at it. I'll share that screen with you now in a second. Okay, over here, over here. Mathematica, got it. And I gotta make sure you see it, and that's good. I might pop the words up a bit so that you can read them easier, but resizing my screen doesn't necessarily make that easier. Okay, so this is a Mathematica notebook. And you got to take some getting used to this, but this is something where I've pre-written a lot of stuff just to help explain things to you. So let's go through the basics of a Mathematica notebook. What I have here is just some text, you know, identifying who I am, uh, you know, a, a header, you know, a separation line, more text. Well, this is just like reading a book. But after I go through 
a header or two and a couple more explanations. Then I got something that looks like it's a computer speak. So let's unwrap this. This is the plat. Uh, this is a command. It's called the plot command. Uh, and just I'll help you out very slowly in Mathematica. It's going to take you to used to. All built-in commands in Mathematica start with a capital letter. All commands and functions are delimited. That is, start and end with square brackets. So here I have a command to plot something. To plot x times 1 minus x over 10. You could probably guess what x from minus 2 to 12 does. I want to use those x's called the domain. And then the range probably describes the size of the window I'm about to see. Now to execute this command, I have to tell Mathematica to do this. I put my cursor anywhere on this command and hit shift enter or shift return. Well, Mathematica did what I told it to do, which was not very fancy. It was an upside down parabola. Uh, what did this aspect ratio two to three do? Do you see that the window that it drew was in proportion of two units of height to three units of width? Sometimes it helps to resize the window. If I had made it four by three, now it's a little taller than it is wide. So aspect ratio is just a leftover argument that made my picture look a little bit nicer. OK, so this is how you talk to Mathematica. You issue it commands. Let's issue it another command. There's other kinds of plotting, vector plotting, stream plotting, a little bit like the words I just used to draw that picture. So I could think of a first order differential equation and plot the vector field created by that equation. It looks a lot like the plot command. Now I added some extra arguments here. Oh, tiny arrows. Let's add an axis, axis equals true, stream points. That's begin like putting a boat down at minus one, one. Let's see what happens if I execute that. And then stream plot is another command. I used the same function, I used a window, and I did another plotting. Now, good things and bad things are about to happen. So I put my cursor anywhere on that line and say shift, enter. This first picture is the vector field, the slope field of this differential equation. And I can even identify the point minus one, one down here in the lower left. Here's an answer that goes through minus one, one. It's like the boat through minus one, one being traced. Okay, that's nice. It would have took me a long time to make that many arrows. Uh, what did stream plot do? Stream plot simultaneously plotted many boats. And that tells me how differential equations flow in this problem. That's very interesting. Now, where did I fail? Notice that in both cases, I wanted my solution through minus one, one to be red. And that did not happen. So why did it not happen? And this is something I will explain to you in a second. I got to find on my own desktop where I had something. I'm running through my desktops and not seeing what I want to see. Here it is. And is that going to help me? I'm looking for a particular command. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Not going to find it there. I won't work too hard to find this command I'm looking for. I'll come back to you in a second. I'm not going to find it there, so I'm not going to worry about it. 
Okay, let me go back to my window that I was sharing with you. You're still there. I got to come back. If I can find my way back. Okay, here's the situation. What I did right here was trying to decorate this graph to make it a little prettier, adding the axes, trying to draw a solution in red, trying to draw the vector arrows, not too large, automatically sized. I was adding arguments to this command. And the reason I did that is because literally I wrote this notebook you know, several years ago, right? Mathematica moves on, all computer programs move on. So I do not need any of this decoration in this problem. And I wonder if I just hit like that. And did stream color function. Now this is way too extreme. But there, it colored my function red. What I'm trying to say to you is do not worry about all the little extra arguments in vector plot. You could have done very well by taking out all of that and just plotting the vector field. But as Mathematica advances, they rewrite commands and arguments to commands. So some of the notebooks that you're looking at that I wrote, I wrote several years ago, maybe even quite a few years ago. So I might be using old versions of those commands that I set up at that time. You're free to experiment by yourself. So for example, if I opened up a blank notebook and just typed vector plot and just used that thing that I drew on the board a second ago, T plus Y. Uh, let me make those words larger for you. So I'm gonna draw that thing that I drew on the board. What T range do I want to use? Let's use a T range from minus two to two. What Y range do I want to use? Let's use a Y range from minus two to two. Uh, tells me I did something wrong. Uh, I left out a comma right there. Yeah, range specification is not in the correct form. This is what you're gonna do frequently, make syntax errors. Oh, there's that, go ahead. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. Yes, very good. I did not share that new window with you. What I have to do is stop sharing. I will kill this. Thank you for pointing that out. Here's what I'll do to, if I open up a different window, I'll share the entire desktop. There we go. This is the window I had a second ago. But if I want to open up a new blank notebook and just type in it, that's what I was trying to demonstrate for you. I apologize. So let's say vector plot, square brackets. Let's do that formula F that I had on the board a second ago. Let's do the T's from minus two to two. Let's do the Y's from minus two to two. Now, look at that. I don't even know how many arrows here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's 256 arrows in less than a 10th of a second. Yes. This computer is my friend. Can I, let's do something else. Let me show you some other cute thing in Mathematica. But right now, here's your problem. You're gonna get into Mathematica. You're gonna trip on the syntax. It's not gonna do what you want it to do. 
right? So that's one reason I gave you my notebooks. So you could have working things in front of you. Even when you try to execute those, they're not going to work because you're going to leave out a comma. Then you send me the notebook you're working on, and I'll point out where you left out the comma. At first, this would be tedious, but pretty soon you'll be using it well. Let me add that stream point. I misspell things. Mathematica tries to help me spell them. I have to add the stream point with a particular number of braces. That is very annoying. But where was it going through? Minus two, one. And let's see if I got the braces right. No, apparently I did not. Sometimes it helps to delimit things like this. That's not going to help me either. I'll try one more time. Well, this is not very exciting. You know what I should do? I should find out how to type this command correctly. Let me go to help, Wolfram documentation. And this is what I was saying to you earlier. You're viewing my whole screen now, so you're viewing all my windows. I could just type in vector plot and see how to use that command. Let me pump up the words and letters. Full detailed documentation, more than you could want or need, but the exciting part is when you slide down the examples. So I could just pick an example and execute it. I could go down through the list of arguments, options. What are the options? Oh, there's an option called, I was looking for an option called stream points and I don't see it. Okay, then I guess I'm misusing that right there. But then I'm gonna go back to my other notebook. I had stream points in there. Why don't I just copy it? It worked there, didn't it? So I'll make it work on my new notebook. Oh, there's a little solution. Let's change it to minus two, one. Ah, so something came up here. Do you see this arrow right here at minus two, one? It is trying to draw a solution, but it didn't succeed. I wonder why. So even machines can fail, right? Let me try something else. Let's call this vector plot a variable called field. So I just assigned the vector plot to the variable called field. Let me do this variable called solution and assign it to plot. Let's have it plot what I thought was a solution, right? Minus t minus one. Let's plot that from t comma minus two to two. Now notice by the way, if I simply tell Mathematica to plot this line, that's not difficult for Mathematica. But when I say solution colon equals, then I am assigning that plot structure to that word. That's kind of useful. When I hit execute now, nothing happens because I didn't ask Mathematica to draw. I asked Mathematica to store the plot structure in that word solution. Now I can ask Mathematica to show me the field and the solution. Oh, there's the line. It both showed me the field and the solution that I thought was gonna work. Okay, that's just a silly minor amount of magic, right? So you'll see this demonstrated on my notebooks where 
I plot something. So sometimes you present things in a style that's easier to read. So here I'm presenting the solution variable as a plot structure with this function and this argument. Mathematica, and I'm doing this simply not by hitting shift return, but by hitting return. Mathematica doesn't care about spaces in the command. So it lets me format the command any way I want to, as long as I format it correctly. And that takes some practice. Okay, now I've got a great idea. I can draw the slope fields of anything I want to see. Let's try that problem working. Nothing happened. Oh, because I just assigned it to a variable. Let me show the field now. Is that the problem you're working on? No, no, no. I was supposed to also multiply by t. I can do multiplication just by simply typing the t next to it, or I can use an asterisk. Show the field. That might look like something that suggests the curves to you, right? Now let's check this out. This diagonal line is no longer useful. It is certainly not the way any boat would flow in this ocean. But I do see from these flow lines that a boat could float horizontally across at one or minus one. Let me put that in here to the plot. Let me take out the negative t plus one and ask Mathematica to plot y equals one and y equals minus one. Here I'm asking Mathematica to plot two things at once, the constant function one and the constant function minus one. You could have Mathematica plot many things at once. I haven't shown anything yet. Now I execute the show command. Okay, there's two solutions that fit that field. So do you see what I'm kind of leading you to do? If you have the formulas for the answers to that problem, you could just draw them on this plot structure. I might want a bigger window. I, want my, I might want more t's or y's. Okay, I can do that. Uh, the other solutions to this problem were fancier than one and minus one. So I'm not gonna type them in here. Some people were asking questions during the office hour notes if you wanna see that. <clears throat> okay, here's where we're gonna go with this. So I'm gonna can this. I just wanted to whet your, whet your appetite for Mathematica and in particular, the documentation is very, very thorough and useful. So look, depending on your computer, look under help, Wolfram documentation, and you can learn anything you want or you can get any example you want. Okay, I'm gonna close, I'm not gonna save. So you can use my math book, uh, you can use my notebooks, you can make your own. I'm gonna stop sharing, go back to my paper. But you're gonna to need to start exploring Mathematica, you're gonna to need to start using it. Uh, I've got people in the audience, we're approaching a break in a moment. I got people in the audience who are from various schools. I said this on the first day, any college, or university that's serious has offered you a free subscription to these programs while you're a student at least. So Delta College has a license that allows you to use this program no charge while you're a student. If you were interested in having your own copy of the software, you could buy it. Depending on how you buy it, it could be kind of expensive. Uh, there are other softwares commonly used. Uh, engineering context, often MATLAB is a powerful software. And I do not use MATLAB. I have seen it. I had a demo copy on my computer. It doesn't operate differently. It just has different rules for operating, but it does all the same things that Mathematica does. In the old days, there was a leading competitor called Maple, which is still around, but pretty much Mathematica and MATLAB ate its lunch. Just beat it up and ate its lunch. 
probably in the context of engineering, MATLAB is more common. You find that at many schools, but in many schools you'd see licenses for all three of these free to students. Okay, very good. So we're about to take a break, but now I'll tell you what we're gonna do in section 1415 and 16. And by the way, every day we do this, we're gonna get more efficient and quicker. So I'm not even doing the pace I want to do today, but we'll deal with it. So now I've got this feeling that the computer could be very helpful to me. Drawing the currents in the ocean. Tracking one particular boat. And so it could. And I'll show you a technique for tracking the boat through the ocean immediately when we come back. It's called Euler's method. But what I want to do after amazing you for a few minutes there is I don't want you to be so in love with these numerical techniques that you get blinded. Because, you know, I'm sure you've heard the old joke. If you want to really screw something up, you know, give it to a computer. We cannot make much fun of computers much longer because as soon as the singularity happens, we're toast, right? Now, I'll tell you, uh, I don't know, any science fiction fans out there, any artificial intelligence fans out there, the singularity is the slang that people use to refer to the moment when the machines actually become conscious. And you say, well, that's science fiction. That's a silly story. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, 20 years ago, it seemed even more science fiction-y, right? You guys watched Watson beating up on humans on Jeopardy. Okay, what I'm saying is, even though computers are exceptionally powerful, when they make mistakes, they make exceptionally large mistakes. So even the numerical methods that I'm about to show you, they work but you gotta be careful not to abuse them or use them in the wrong context. And you gotta be careful to track the errors that could occur. But there's a very simple way to track this boat through the ocean. It's called Euler's method. It is so silly and simple. You're gonna say, that can't be true. That can't be real, but it is. Okay, so we're knocking out one, three, and one, four right now. Then we'll come back to one, five, and one, six. We'll show you what Euler's method is as soon as we come back. But let's take a short break. Uh, what time is it? It's one o'clock. Let's come back at 1.05. Just so you can stretch your legs, relax, get a drink. I'll see you in a few.
Okay, we're back. And not lots and lots of perks of working out of your basement or working out of your home. But there are some. Go up and grab a handful of sunflower seeds. Or you can pet the pet rabbit. Or you can check on the cap. And everything's good. Oh. There, by the way, in case you're interested, there's a pet rabbit, a very smart rabbit. <laughs> it's already studying differential equations. And it is very serious about the differential equations, as you can see. Okay, back to work. So I wanna make sure I'm on the right window. Got it, got it, okay. So yeah, let me show you this method called Euler's method and you're gonna say, I don't believe it. I don't believe you're gonna get away with that. I don't believe you can do that. So we're gonna solve differential equations with nothing more than the equation of a line from your very first algebra class. Let's look at this EY plane. You know, T, independent variable, traditionally horizontal axis, Y, dependent variable, traditionally vertical axis. And I have a differential equation and a starting point. Now we just learned that I could draw all kinds of arrows all over this to get the idea, right? But first of all, I haven't given you a formula and I don't wanna litter the drawing, right? So let's just think about where we are in this boat right now. In this boat right now, by putting T naught and Y naught into there, I can learn the slope that that boat is experiencing in this differential equation. Maybe it's going that way. So I'll call the slope of that line M naught. And this is how you would pilot a boat or a plane for that matter, or even sometimes a car. You just go along that direction for a little while, right? For an hour or a minute or 10 seconds. And then you take another location reading. Why don't we call this location reading T1Y1? And since I've arrived at a new location, I will check to see what direction the wind is blowing at that moment or at that location by putting in T1 and Y1. And now I see that the wind is blowing that way. Let's call the slope of this line M1. And a little bit of time goes by and I take another reading. Now you can see what's gonna happen. I'm gonna do this all across the ocean, uh, literally course correcting as I go along. Now you can imagine that if I course correct more often, my course will be more accurate, right? But more often is always a relative term. Should I course correct every hour? Should I course correct every minute? Should I course correct every second? Well, that probably depends on what you're doing. But we could pick a sufficiently small amount of time. We could course correct every five seconds. We could course correct uniformly. You know, T1, T0 is going to be the first time interval. But here I am at T2, Y2. I could make all of these time intervals uniform. Good, now let's do a super zoom on one time interval. Let's call this TKYK and I'll do a super zoom for you. And let's call this the next point, which would be TK plus one, YK plus one. 
And what's the slope that connects those two dots? Well, by reading how I've done so far, just counting m naught, m1, this must be slope mk. And slope mk is f of tk yk. So somewhere in my boat, I've got a slopometer that's telling me the way the wind is blowing at every moment, the way the water is flowing, the way the electricity is flowing, the way the magnetic field is directing. You know, I could use any kind of analogy I like, but let's do a super zoom on this window on the next page. Number of my page. So here's my super zoom. Here's TK, YK. Here is TK plus one, YK plus one. And here is the line segment that connects them, whose slope is MK. Now you can almost tell what I'm going to do next in, in a way, but you know, I said I was going to use the equation of a line and I don't even use more than the equation of the line. This MKYK came from my formula in the differential equation. But if anybody gives me two points, I know I can also find MK by just using those two points. How do you use those two points? YK plus one minus YK divided by TK plus one minus TK. You know, we're often using T for our independent variable because we so often refer to time. You can use X for independent variable if you want. Depends on what tool you're using. You know, you can use any letter you want as long as you keep your letters straight. But this ratio has to be equal to that MK, which is F of TK, YK. Now let's turn this on its head. Let's turn this upside down. And let's say I was standing at the point TK, YK, and I wanted to predict where I would be at the next five second interval, or one second interval, or 20 year interval. Time is relative. I can use whatever units I need to in any problem. What I want to do is know the position that I will be at next. Well, the TK plus one is easy because remember, every time interval is TK plus one minus TK. It's just the difference between the last two Ts. So in that sense, if I turn that equation around, TK plus one is my last reading on my watch plus the elapsed time that I'm using. So here's the reading where I'm standing right now. And then I let five seconds go by. Well, then that's five seconds later. So I know that, but I can use this equation to know my next position. Solve this equation for yk plus one. Now this is not impressive. You know, like no one's gonna give me the Nobel prize for this, right? I'm just solving for yk plus one. What's my next step? Let's add yk to both sides. MK came from my slopometer, which was the differential equation, right? So I'll put in F of TK, YK here. That is the slope. And this TK plus one minus TK, well, I had a shorter name for that. It's my elapsed time. It's the Delta T. Well, now what do I have? I have a formula that predicts, predicts my next Y position. I know how to predict my next T position. So if I can take this slope reading, I can predict where I will be in the next second. Now, 
or the next five seconds, et cetera. Now let's make this really exciting and then let's have some real fun. So let's say I wanted to repeat that over and over and over again. Why don't we make a table where I will write my T readings, my Y readings, my slope readings, And then you see what I'm gonna call this right here. This right here is the difference between yk and y plus one and yk, right? This is the difference in y. Just like this is the difference in t. So to abbreviate this, this is my delta y. It's my change in y. It's the difference between where I am and where I will be or where I am and where I was. So I'll make a column for both the delta T and the delta Y. And then over here, just for the heck of it, why don't we make a counter? Like what K am I on? Initially I was on K equals zero. That means I was at T naught Y naught. But then I plugged those numbers into here and got a reading called M naught. And then I took the time interval, whatever it was, five seconds, 10 seconds, let's say it is a 10th of a second. How do I get my new position change? Well, the rate of change times the amount of time elapsed the multiplication of those two is the position change. I'm doing this with too many letters. In a second, we'll start to do it with numbers. But now, how do I know my next position? My next position is going to be T naught plus delta T. That'll be my new T1. And my next Y will be y naught plus delta y. That'll be my y1. I'm writing too many things in this table. But then you see, I'm just gonna repeat it over and over again. I'll repeat it and I'll repeat it and I'll repeat it and I'll repeat it. Now I myself would get tired of repeating this and I probably would make a lot of mistakes along the way. But as the joke goes, I have a friend. And my friend is very good at making tables and repeating calculations. And what's the name of my friend? Go ahead, say it out loud. Or type it in the chat box, I don't mind. What did I just draw for you on this piece of paper? I just drew a spreadsheet. Say, isn't that like the cells in a spreadsheet? And when you add this cell is that cell plus that cell, and then this cell is that cell plus that cell, and then you could pull down the cells, you could pull down the cells, you could fill in the whole table. I don't mind, I don't know how much work you do with spreadsheets. You may not do lots of work, but this is a pretty basic work, writing a table and filling in all these things and then just pulling down to fill in the table. I have some spreadsheets pre-prepared for you. So let's look at one. Uh, I would download this from my website, but I'm just gonna open up one here that's on my desktop so that I don't go through that downloading experience. Uh, let's look at problem 1420 in your book. And this may be too much work, but I'm going to open it up. And then I'll share it with you. And then I probably have decided that I've gone too far. I think I've gone too far. Uh, let me, oh, now I got to do the sharing part. 
share screen, Excel notebook. Okay, here we are. What I did is made a table in Excel and I have to fill in the first few lines ordinarily. And this problem 1.4 number 20, you can look this up in your book, but I have a formula here for the differential equation. I have an initial value of zero and minus one. The formula I can use to say minus one half of cell C8 plus the cosine, Excel does cosines, of three times the cell B8. And that turns out to be 1.5. Then I could pick a DT of 0.1. And then I can multiply the dy will be what? The slope reading times the dt. Now just for kicks, I also drew a picture of the cosine here in red, I believe. I think I drew the cosine picture in red, that's right. Because the cosine was part of this problem. I wanted to show you how the solution is related to that cosine curve. Okay, so what did I do after I did that? I had to, rewrite the second line again here, but let me see what happens. Let me dramatically shorten this instead of a hundred lines. Let's just look at the first 10 lines. And what I did is made each DT equal to the one above it. So this cell is equal to the cell above it. This cell is equal to the cell above it. And that way, if I change DT once, I get the whole table to refill and recalculate. Now you can have to download my table and examine it and play with it yourself. I don't know what experience you have in Excel. You notice that course correcting every half second was not too impressive, but it's kind of impressive. And all I gotta do is pull down to get more points. Now I made this chart automatically read the points on this table. Again, that's you know, how much experience in Excel do you have? I don't know, but I can help you out if you want to ask a question about it. I don't think 0.5 is very good. I think one second is even worse. Why don't we try 0.25? Let's course correct every quarter of a second. Okay, a little smoother. The blue thing looks a little smoother. Let's course correct every tenth of a second. That's where we came in. Good, but that's not a lot of points because that means I'm gonna make a lot of calculations. I need to pull down some more. Okay, pulling down some more. There, it filled in some more. Let's course correct every hundredth of a second. Now, this is a little bit excessive, first of all, because a hundredth of a second, I need to do 100 calculations just to move one second. So let's pull down to 100. Yeah, I pulled down farther. I pulled down to 108. Let's stop at 100. Do you see now the time is one second? I've actually gone one second. I got a beautiful graph but it only is good for one second. So, you know, machines cost money to operate, right? That's why Bitcoin is gonna fail because actually it costs money to mine Bitcoins and you mess, you know, who's, who's operating 75% uh, of the mining in Bitcoin right now? I believe it's in China. Of course, you have to verify anything I say like that. But anyway, people mining Bitcoin are using a tremendous amount of resources, right? So anything you do with a computer uses resources, but I don't think it costs me too much to calculate that. I could do another 900 lines and I won't even blink. I'll just let the computer add together. I understand what the computer's doing, but I have no desire to calculate 1000 lines in a spreadsheet but it's relatively accurate, even a 10th of a second. What I get is here something that's actually close to the truth. Now, remember the red curve is the cosine and the blue wiggle is the solution to this problem. 
you still are taking my word for it that that blue wiggle is actually a solution, right? You can't check it unless I give you the formula. Now, we're not ready to give you the formula for that blue wiggle. That'll be tomorrow. But if I put up the formula for the true wiggle next to the blue wiggle, at this one-tenth of an interval, one-tenth of a second interval, you would not be able to tell the difference. That's because this differential equation, I can track accurately with just a small delta t. Sometimes this can fail, but this time this works. The problem for you is telling the difference between it works and when it fails. Okay, so I want you to do a spreadsheet for one of your homework problems. And I picked a spreadsheet where the function on the outside here is defined in pieces, because that's another great thing that this could do, is if I changed this function to define things piecewise, let me see if I could do that right here. Let's say up to that point, I suddenly want the red thing to be equal to one. Let's see what happens to the blue solution. If I suddenly say, stop wiggling cosine and make it all one. Well, that's interesting. The cosine stopped wiggling and became all one. The blue wiggle didn't change. Do I need to update my spreadsheet? Let's see what happens if I take this. And update that spreadsheet. Nope, it actually, okay, I've got to correct a formula here and I'm probably not gonna spend time to correct it now. But the idea is that you could change the input fill down and that changes the input function from cosine three T to one period of cosine three T followed by one. How would that change the output function? I'd kind of really like to see that right now and it's not happening for me. So I'm trying to think about how expensive it is going to be for that to happen for me. I have to take this cell and fill that out. Then I have to take this cell and fill that out and I have to take that cell and fill that out. And those two things are right there. Where is my issue? Oh, it's right there that I'm referring to the cosine instead of the contents of that cell. So let me see if I can fix that. I'll change this to be, it's a little bit of dangerous. The contents of that cell then I'll change this one to be the contents of that cell. And then I'll pull down. At first, nothing happens because I'm still operating under the cosine function. But now let's see what happens if I pull down all the way through here, adjust all the formulas. Okay. Apart from the fact that this would be a very good demo, I do not want to spend exceptional amount of time on this. I'll try one more time. This is going to be equal to that. I think now I can pull down. Excuse me. And now I pull down here. Yeah, that's what happened. Now you can't explain it. I can't explain it to you yet because you don't have the tools. But do you see when I did one loop of cosine followed by a flat line, my solution changed from repeating oscillations to really approaching a flat line. Not the same flat line, but I don't want you to do that calculation, although you're gonna do a similar calculation in your homework, 
What I want you to do is be amazed that even such a calculation could be automated. So your homework problem has something where the function in the differential equation is like a flat line for a period of time and then a diagonal line downwards. Can you see how that affects the solution? Can you fill in the table properly? That's your assignment. Okay, I'm gonna get out of there and stop saving that. And I think I'm gonna land back at my paper. Is that good? Yes. Okay, so this method is called Euler's method. And Euler, you know, top mathematician, I mean, like baseball players, right? Who are the best baseball players of all time? You know, Babe Ruth, Henry Aaron. I don't want to get into the steroid era. But if you ask mathematicians, give me the top three mathematicians of all time. Of course, you'd get lots of debate. But this person, Leonard Euler, Swiss mathematician, would probably be on 99% of the list. Maybe number one, maybe number two. But he was a big one. This was before spreadsheets. This was before computers or calculators, literally 1700s. He said, all we have to do is follow this procedure of course correction to estimate. So the things I'm teaching you are modern, but they're also very old. Okay, now we got to approach something a little more difficult and serious. So I want to end with these last two sections that I've previewed a little bit. I'm also gonna pull up a copy of my book because while I could write what is written in the book, that would require time. It wouldn't be a very good use of time. Let's just say in section 1.5, we're talking about a technical problem. When I write down a differential equation, whatever the f of t and y is, when I specify an initial condition, whatever the t naught and y naught is, by the way, this is a differential equation. When you do the differential equation and initial condition, it's called, you read in your book, initial value problem. This is just the differential equation. This initial value says I want a solution, but I want a solution with a special property. But I've got two serious problems. How do I even know there's a solution? Like I said to you with the complex numbers at the beginning, just because I can write down an equation doesn't mean there's an answer to the equation, right? <clears throat> so I'd be in serious bad shape if I was trying to predict the future with what I was observing in the laboratory, but uh, the differential equation I wrote didn't have an answer. That would be a failure. Here's a bigger failure. How do I know that there's not more than one solution? Now these are legalistic things, right? But actually very, very important. Let's say you're in the laboratory, you're observing this liquid boiling at a certain temperature on your lab table. Let's use T twice, excuse me. And you've worked out the differential equation that governs the temperature of this liquid and there's actually an answer. And this liquid's gonna go super critical in five seconds. 
but wait a minute, your lab partner has also solved the differential equation and says, yeah, you're right. But I think that liquid's gonna cool off and become stable. Now here I've drawn two different functions. They both go through the initial value. They both satisfy the same direction flow for a short time, but then they diverged. Is that even possible? Is that a thing? As my daughter would say. That would be pretty sad if you had a differential equation that had two answers and one ended in disaster and one ended in stability and you didn't know which was about to happen, right? So these are two critical questions. How do I even know there's an answer? And if I have an answer, how do I know that there's not another answer that's more correct than the one I have? Maybe there's thousand answers, maybe like parallel universes and stuff, right? Well, the answer is it's not gonna be so exotic with a few conditions. I'll say this colloquially at a relatively inexpensive cost. That means it's not gonna to be too exotic. We can actually know that a differential equation, I'll abbreviate, has one and only one solution. But it doesn't come up without a cost. Everything has a cost, right? But this cost is gonna be very mild. So now I'm gonna read you the cost out of the book. And I very, very rarely do I just read things out of the book. The only reason I'm doing this is because I do not wanna write down the paragraph they wrote down. You're never going to write down this paragraph that they wrote down. Uh, it's something we need to know, but think of it as like a legal document. I'm going to look at check 65. I'm gonna get this and then I'm gonna open it up for you to see. Just looking at a PDF copy of the book right here. It's better than putting the book under the camera. So let me resize this so we can look at it together. You move that out of the way. So you're seeing what I'm seeing, good. I wanna highlight this sentence. Well, this theorem. This theorem is the price that we have to pay to get a guaranteed answer. It's called the existence theorem. I'll come back to it in a second. But that's not very comforting. I don't wanna know that I just have an answer. I'd like to know that the answer is unique. And so this is the price that I'm gonna to have to pay if I want the answer to be unique. Now what's written here, I will decode for you relatively simply, but let's think about it again as math lawyer speak. You do need to know what it means. You don't need to execute it. You don't need to repeat it necessarily. If we were in a classroom together, I might have you like recite it in unison or something. But let's read through the words and then let me tell you what they mean. And you're gonna say, well, that's entirely reasonable. That's not too expensive. They're not asking for my firstborn child. They just want a little bit 
of consistency. And then I can expect reasonably that I have an answer. Let's read this together. So suppose the function f of t and y is continuous. What function? The function in my differential equation. Let's say it's continuous in a rectangle of some size. That's the fancy letters right there. Let t run from a to b, let y run from c to d. And let's suppose that the point where you're starting is actually in this rectangle where the function is continuous. Then here comes the payoff, but it is underwhelming at first. It says there is an epsilon and a function. There is a number, epsilon greater than zero. Whenever a mathematician says epsilon, they generally mean a small number, but we're not gonna qualify this at all. It just means there's a number bigger than zero. Now the bigger than zero could be a million, bigger than zero could be one one thousand. And there is a function that lives within that one one thousandth of t naught. That's that expression right here. Undo that and write larger. So there is a guaranteed time limit, epsilon. There is a function such that what? Your equation has an answer that goes through that point. Now this is written in math words, but I just spoke it in English. You could practice reading the math words, but I wanna draw this for you because that would be more meaningful. So what that theorem just said is if we have a differential equation, dy dt equals f of t of y, and we have a point where someone told us to start, t not, y not. And here's what we can't permit. This function cannot be crazy or out of control at that point because then we'll have no control. But let's say that this function is well behaved in this place, around this place, and well behaved for us in this problem simply means continuous. You've heard the word continuous in your calculus classes. Continuous is not a drastic condition as long as this function is continuous. Now this is a function of two variables. A function of two variables is a surface. You learned that in Calc 3. So a continuous surface, not a continuous pencil drawing on the paper. Where does this function have to be good? Does the function have to be good everywhere? No, the theorem just says it has to be good just in that area. What area? Oh, let's say A to B on the t-axis. Let's say C to D on the y-axis. But here's the funny payoff. You'd expect it to say next, then you have a happy solution that lives throughout your rectangle. But the theorem didn't say that. The theorem said then there is a number, a possibly small number called epsilon. And in that tiny area, could be tiny, could be huge, it might be small, then there is a function It goes through that point and solves that problem. The first reaction is, well, thanks a lot. You mean I answer might only live for a thousandth of a second? And the, and the answer is yes, it might. But remember what we're doing. We're in the prediction of the future business. And if you could even look a half second into the future, do you realize how much money people would give you? Not that you guys are after money. So any solution is victory. If it only lasts for a second, then I'm happy. If it lasts 
for the whole real line. If this rectangle is infinitely large, then I'm also very happy. But I'm not going to throw away any answer just because I'm prejudiced and I think it's too small. This picture is what those words said. You will have an answer. And now this is the, called the existence theorem. Let me explain the uniqueness theorem. I'm not gonna go back and read that piece of paper, but I'll tell you what we have to do to get uniqueness. You say, what do you mean what we have to do? Well, I've opened your mind now to realize that you have to pay for what you want, right? I had to pay to get that answer. What did I have to pay? I had to pay that that function was continuous. But I know a lot of continuous functions, many functions, almost, you know, lots and lots of functions are continuous. That doesn't seem to be so expensive to me. That doesn't seem to be so rare. But here comes uniqueness. And to make this the only answer on that interval, I not only need f to be continuous, but I also need, get ready, this is weird, the partial derivative of f with respect to y to be continuous in the rectangle. Let's call this rectangle r. Now, if you have the function, you can take its partial derivative. As long as the partial derivative doesn't screw up, then I get not only that that is an answer, but it is the only answer, again, on that tiny window. So if there's another answer that comes floating around, maybe they only agree on that tiny window, but that uniqueness will be enough to make me happy. That is called the existence and uniqueness theorem. That is section 1.5. Now, what you're gonna do with problems in 1.5, and I've already posted your homework for 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6, is you have to experience that. Not experience it by solving equations, but experience it by looking at different equations and sniffing out where the box ends where the solution fails. And it's not hard to do that, but when you first entered the class, you just thought, oh, I'm gonna solve every differential equation that comes my way. That's like, you know, Barry Bonds saying, I'm gonna hit every fastball that comes my way. Well, eventually he slowed down and he started doing the roids, right? That's why he doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. Of course, neither does Roger Clemens or any number of other people. I'm a baseball fan. Do you see the idea is when you want to accomplish something, you always have to pay for it. But as long as you're aware of what you have to pay for it, it doesn't seem to be always a burden. And as long as you're aware where the guarantees end, then you won't make any unreasonable predictions about the future. You'll say, well, here I got a solution, but uh, remember it's only good for the next five seconds or five years or five centuries. Depends on your time scale. Okay, so what you're gonna do in section 1.5 is look at some differential equations and examine where the function could go bad and try to figure out where the solution fails. And it's not always sneaky. I mean, when it fails, it fails dramatically. But can you see the failure for what it is? Can you see the failure for you not paying the price for these conditions not being met? Okay, that's the goal of that section. Okay, one more word and then we'll let you go. Let's just look at section 1.6, introducing it quickly. This will be enough to help you get started. 
And now we've turned the corner in chapter one. We have th three weapons. We even know when we can expect to have answers and when they're unique. So we got some tools. For the rest of chapter one, we want to develop some other special tools. Now, there are many, many more things I can tell you about soap fields and you know, we'll drop them as we come along during the course. So this is a different special tool that doesn't apply to every differential equation you meet. So let's at least lay it out for a few minutes like this. This is a general. First order, ordinary, differential equation. After a while, there's so many vocabulary words, you can't have time to write them down. The general differential equation says, First order, ordinary, says I can use any kind of messed up combination of T's and Y's that I please. In section 1.2, you ran across a special case. What happens if this function can be easily split into two pieces? Well, you called that separable. And it had a wonderful quality that you might be able to find out an answer with just two integrals, right? So let's go down some special cases now. Here's another special case. This is what this section is about. What if the function on the right-hand side didn't have T in it? What if it just had a Y? That's a special case. It's not this, although it is separable, right? Because if it only has a Y, I just slide the Y's over here, slide the DT's over there. So this would be a subset of separable. But the fact that it doesn't depend on time, how unusual is that? Does not depend on time. Slope does not depend on time. Well, there's a word for that in English. And the word is autonomous. Now you're more likely to use that word when you talk about driving your Tesla, right? Oh, let's let the go Tesla go on autopilot. Let's make a video for YouTube. Autonomous means it didn't need your help in that context. In this context, autonomous means not dependent on time does not depend on time. And these equations right here have some special qualities that are valuable to us. And in fact, they're plentiful. If they were easy to solve, but very rare, they wouldn't mean anything to us because I don't see them very often. But these are actually easier to solve and evaluate qualitatively and they're common. Let me give you an example. The most valuable problem in all differential equations. This is exponential growth. This is autonomous. The function on the right-hand side does not depend on T. Even the logistic growth problem. This problem is autonomous. Function on the right-hand side does not depend on T. And what does autonomous mean in a practical sense? In a practical sense, autonomous means this. I'll take the logistic growth equation that I showed you yesterday. It had solutions that looked like this. Autonomous means that if I have a solution that goes through this point, like I launch that boat, at zero seconds at that point. What if I had launched the boat instead an hour later? If the equation is not dependent on time, then it doesn't matter when I launch the boat because the slope will have nothing to do with time. What I will get is the same equation, answer. 
just what? Horizontally translated down the timeline. Same thing here, instead of going through this point, if I want to go through this point, well, the same answer, horizontally translated. Same thing down here. So autonomous equations are special because this is something you got to bank, put this in the bank now. Any horizontal translation of a solution, too many words, but worth writing, remains a solution. It's still a solution. Any horizontal translation of a solution is still a solution. What does that mean? That means if I find one solution, I found thousands, millions. I just horizontally translate it. Now, how that relates to what a phase line is, this will be the last thing I say, but it's not enough, so we'll pick up here next time. If, if every solution is a horizontal translation of a solution, then the slope field is always constant on a horizontal line. That means drawing the slope field on this graph is extraordinarily redundant, right? I mean, I have different heights, yeah? Now it's going down faster. But on every level, the slope field is the same slope. Here on these equilibrium solutions, what's the slope field? Zero slope. These are two equilibrium solutions. What about between these two equilibrium solutions? Growth indicated by a positive arrow. What about above this top equilibrium solution? Decay indicated by a negatively directed arrow. What about below this lower equilibrium solution? Again, downwardness indicated by a negative arrow. This thing that I just drew is called a phase line. It is a crushing of the slope field plane. It is a condensing. It is a time saving of drawing this giant picture. Do you see this unstable equilibrium in the lower place? Solutions are being emitted by that equilibrium in a sense, it seems like that, that's called a source. What about the equilibrium solution where things are being absorbed? Again, we borrow from the physics language, that is called a sink. If you have an equilibrium that is neither source nor sink, it is called a node. Okay, that is enough to make you dangerous in section 1-6, but, and it's enough to get you started if you wanna look at the homework problem, but I think I wanna say more next time. Uh, what did we do today? We timed ourselves a little bit better. So uh, the beginning is always a difficult thing. So we will get better and better. We will cover things better and better, but it does help to be speaking them with someone. So, that's the value I'm trying to add. Uh, you finish up the homework you're working on. You can send me some questions. I'm going to get these videos posted by three. That's my habit. I said that in email. Uh, I may be unavailable till much later tonight. Uh, so I might not be totally on my email till maybe like eight or nine. Now I'm not going to stay on my email all day, all night for you although I don't mind helping, I want to help. Work on your first batch of homework problems. Send me some questions. I'll try to fire back your questions in the order you ask them. And you know, this first homework you're exploring, second homework you're exploring, you're gonna get better and better, but it's going to take time. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good afternoon.